freedom. It's something we cherish in this country. The idea of a free society is embedded into the very core of our nation. Many have died defending it, and many have fought diligently to preserve it. So where has it gone? We've become a nation bound by division, chained by hatred, and consumed by selfishness. There's an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. Does this look like freedom? The Bible tells us we're called to be free, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly, in love. Maybe that's what we're missing in America. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time we recognize that true independence is found only in a lasting dependence on God. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Thank you for watching that. And I, I wanted to present that, especially this weekend for the 4th of July. And um, our message today uh, is really about you and in the place of freedom. Many of you, we've gone through so many things and we have so much coming at us and so many decisions that we have to make. So from the series that Thomasine and I both did together, uh, called Decisions, Decisions, Decisions. Ever, anybody ever felt like you had to just make so many decisions? And so um, we're going to talk about today. One of the things that Thomasine is sharing in this message, because the message today is, the title is, In the Meantime. When you have all these decisions to make and you've prayed and you've asked God, and it seems like, you know, you don't know where God is and you wonder if God even cares uh, what do you do in the meantime while you're waiting? That's what this message is all about. So we're excited to share it, and I would like for you to just tune in at this point and take notes. All right? God bless you. But I'm excited about the message this morning again. Yes, yes. Um, today we're dealing with something that is so critical when we're in the throes of decision making. Last week we dealt with um, hanging in the balance when we don't know which way, what the outcome is going to be, the uncertainty and, and all of that, just, just not knowing, precarious position could go either way. And so this week we're going to deal with in the meantime. And that is, is so relevant as well to decision making. And it's, it's important to look at this because, you know, many of us have grown up in situations, quote, in church where we've been trained that if we just do certain things and if we do them enough and, and um, if our faith is strong enough, then we'll always be healthy, we'll always have plenty of money, and we'll always have these great circumstances. And so what we're doing today is in the, dealing with, in the meantime, we're dealing with waiting because that's an important part of decision-making. It's always a part of decision-making. But also we want to deal with this from a, a, a biblical balanced view because we can get our expectations uh, so locked into things turning out a certain way all mm -hmm. the time, but they don't always turn out out the way we expect them to. Amen. And so um, this is going to help us get a perspective on what to do while we're waiting. And so um, Pastor Woody is going to uh, move into the teaching this morning in the meantime and help us get a um, perspective <laughs> as we move Thanks. forward. Thanks, honey. Um, this is, I, I'd love to start out with a question, and again, apologize, I can't show you the question so that you can read it, but 
What do you do in the meantime, you know, when there's nothing that you can do while you're waiting? Um, and in our situation that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, uh, Thomasine's cancer journey and our journey together, you know, it's, it's something that we prayed about. And so many of you, you've prayed about different things. You've asked God to heal you of different things. You've prayed about, and it's not just about your body and health, other things. You've prayed about jobs. You believe for certain uh, promotions. You've believed you know, it could be a relationship, you and your family. It is, you may be in a marriage that you're not really happy in, but you thought this was going to work out, and it seems like it's not working out. Or maybe you thinking about getting married. It seems like that's not going to work out. Some of you may be asking, will I ever find the right person? But all of those questions, what do you do while you are waiting? What do you do while, if you've been praying about this, what do you do while uh, the prayer hasn't been answered, while you haven't seen any results of the prayer? And so while you're waiting, what happens? There's some things that happen while you're waiting, there's some things that should happen while you're waiting. And when those things don't happen, we begin to take on certain feelings. Um, uh, another question I'd like to ask is, have you ever felt like God was just absent? Like, you know, you know how I remember when I was in school, <laughs> when um, we used to have, we had to raise our hand and say here, you know, when they do roll call. And so sometimes when we're in a situation or circumstance or adversity, we're like, okay, God, where are you? We expect him to say, I'm here, and you don't hear anything. And so have you ever felt like God was just absent from your situation? And, you know, um, maybe you're thinking maybe he's upset with me. Maybe he's not pleased with me, even if he's not angry. Maybe he's not pleased, and so he's, he's not listening. Maybe it's something that I did. Um, maybe you know, you're feeling like you've done something wrong and, and you don't know what it is and you've displeased him and therefore um, you don't know why he's not answering or why you don't receive anything. So when you're in that kind of situation, what do you do? Um, what do you do, honey? My goodness. <laughs> when you really talk about it, but um, it's, it's such a, that's such a hard time. You know, we can sometimes get um, close, so spiritual that we don't even want to admit that that is a hard, hard time. Yeah, yeah. But it is a hard time, and that's why we need the Lord during those times, because that is when the first thing we need to do is we need to get a perspective. Mm -hmm. We need to we need to decide back to decisions. Okay. Mm -hmm. We need to decide. How am I going to look at this thing? How, what is my outlook going to be? What is my perspective going, going to be? If, if we don't get the right perspective, then really and truly we could go crazy. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in a personal way, when it came to the cancer journey, if I could not have gotten a perspective, I really could have just lost it. I mean, two times going through this process and then other times going through the same process in terms of the testing and the scans and all that and then finding out, praise God, that it wasn't cancer uh, those times. But you can still, your mind can take off in so many d directions, our minds. And so there is a, there is a scripture or in places in the, a play, one place in the scripture uh, dealing with the Apostle Paul, he talks about in, in your waiting, it talks about possessing your soul, meaning get a grip hmm. on your soul, get a grip on your mind and your will and your emotions. And so that was, that was the process that I had to continually engage in throughout and still am because it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And see, the, the, I always say that the waiting is, is mental warfare. Okay. And so I had to get a perspective of hope. Mm -hmm. That was one of the first things. You want me to keep going? Or you want yeah, yeah, yeah. So hope gives us an outlook um, that lines up with what God wants for us. Hope, according to the Bible, is what anchors our souls. It's, it's what allows us to be stable 
in our thinking, which what allows us to be stable in how we make decisions and how we how we uh, feel. Mm -hmm. Because at those times, it's it's just it's it is in the natural, just day to day life. It's like a roller coaster. You could be here one mom one moment. Oh, I'm so hopeful, and yes, I believe I believe for this outcome. And I believe God's going to heal me. And I believe. And then at the same time, there are our own thoughts. And then there are thoughts from the devil. And sometimes there are things that people say that can throw us into a whole different place. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's hope that helps help me and helps us at those times. And the only way we can get hope is if we have something to hold on to. And what I had to hold on to and what we have to hold on to during those times is the promises of God. And so when, when we're in a situation where we have to make decisions, and especially when they're critical decisions, it is, it is essential to find out what God and how God feels about the situation. And then, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, honey, but for me, and I think this is true for most of us, when we have something critical and it's, it's urgent and, and life-threatening especially, we have a picture in our minds of how we want God to answer us. And so for me, I wanted, I wanted a certain kind of miracle. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I, I hear about people, and you guys have heard about people who have gone through things, and maybe it's someone who says, you know, I had this test, and... Uh, I had this mammogram, and, and they said they saw something on my scan, and they want me to come back again, and, and uh, <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm praying, I'm believing God, and we definitely have to believe God, but we don't want to box God in either, and so I wanted the kind of miracle that some of these folks got when they said, praise God, I went back, and the, and the doctor said, you know, I don't know what showed up on that first scan. But I don't see anything now. <laughs> that's, the that's, kind of, that's what you want to hear. That's the kind of miracle right. I wanted. But right. that's not the kind of miracle I got. Okay. That's not the kind of healing I got. Mm. After I was further down the road in the journey, and we were making decision, another decision and doing more waiting mm -hmm. for tests, I just knew that, test, that particular test was going to come back saying chemotherapy is not recommended. Okay, yeah. And honestly, my heart dropped when they said, you know, we are so surprised. We didn't expect this outcome, but according to your score, chemotherapy is, is advisable. I could have mm -hmm. made, still made the decision. So again, I'm, I, that's not what I wanted, but I had to get to the place where I could surrender mm -hmm. and say, Lord, however you, however you want to heal me, however you want to do this, I just yield to it. Amen. Amen. And when we look at scripture and Thomas, he mentioned the apostle Paul talking about hope. Um, you know, we, we look to God, we look for, you know, what we expect him to do either based on what we've read or what he's done. We know he's done for some, someone else. And we, we kind of want to see the same thing done for us. So we want to look at some scripture today where, um, a very popular person in the new Testament, um, he had something to say about this. And the Apostle Paul, we talked about him last week also, um, where he, you know, was, he was talking to the Corinthian church. And even though he was talking about sexual sins, we applied it to our health walk. Well, today, this is the same church that he's talking to. Uh, this is the second letter that he wrote to them. And he's focusing on something else. There were a group of people, really false prophets, false apostles, who were spreading the word in the in Corinthian that uh, in Corinth that Paul was not a legitimate disciple. He was not a legitimate apostle. And see, Paul is a little different because Paul did not know Jesus before Jesus was re resurrected. He did not know the pre-crucified Jesus. He didn't know Jesus uh, in the flesh only. He only knew Jesus after Jesus had been raised from the dead. 
And so he has a different kind of relationship. And that was one of the criteria of being an apostle, those who spent time with Jesus and those who actually after, you know, the day of Pentecost did miracles. And so Paul had done many, many miracles and God had worked through him. That's how the other uh, apostles accepted him in. He had proof of miracles that God was using him because Paul was one of these guys who he he was not um, he was not a Christian. He hated Christians and was putting them in jail and killing them and setting them up to be killed. And then now he's converted. And so he's got he's converted others and has different small churches out. And this is one of those churches. And so he's encouraging them uh, to, you know, have some confidence in who he is. And so he finally let them know that he had had some revelation from God that other apostles didn't have yet. <laughs> you know, that God had given me some special revelation. And so we're going to get into what he's saying here. And so we can understand, but Paul is going to get to a part where he wants something from God and he believed that God should do it and God did not do it. And Paul had to make a decision. So um, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me uh, to Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter and the seventh verse. Uh, and again, we apologize for not being able to put this on the screen for you. But the King James Version, I'll read first. The King James Version says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. So Paul had something, Paul had received some visions. He received some revelations from God. And he's saying now, uh, so that I'm not exalted above, you know, so that I don't get beyond myself, basically what he's saying, so that I don't get uh, outside of myself. Because, I mean, when you've got revelation that other people don't have, you probably feel kind of special. And so he said, because of this, then he says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So this is not something that um, even if we say that God didn't do it, God still allowed this to happen. He said there was given to me. So even if God didn't personally do it, he allowed the enemy to do it. He said there was given to me a thorn in the flesh in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, um, let me, let me, I'm going to read that to you in the New International Version, and it, it's a little more in today's language. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, <laughs> in order, you know, for me to keep a lid on my excitement, in order for me to not get beyond myself of what God is doing in me because I'm not the only one on the earth that God is using, even though it seems like I am, it seems like I'm doing more than anybody else. It's kind of the way Paul felt on the inside. He said, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So we've heard two words here that Satan was given, uh, you know, permission to do, torment Paul and buffet Paul. And both those words come from the Greek words that those two words come from. It actually means to strike somebody with the fist. It means to beat someone. It's actually to, to, and to torment. It's over and over and over and over again. He said, so there was a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh is like, um, have you ever got a splinter in your hand that was not sticking out beyond the, the top anymore so you couldn't quite get it out? It's in there. It's in there and you're trying to get it out. And he's saying, this is the kind of thing it was. It kept, it keeps bothering me. And you might, if you don't get it out, you might get busy doing some things and you kind of forget about it. But then all of a sudden, boom, it shows up again. And the pain is there and the inflammation is there. He's saying, this was a thorn in my flesh. This thing bothered me. And the purpose, now this is, this, that's a new word for us when it comes to this kind of, suffering or adversity. He really said the purpose that God allowed this to happen is because, so that I would not be conceited. Now, I don't know why God allows certain things to happen to me or to you, but um, that may be something you want to find out if that's the case. That's not always the case. But if God is allowing something to happen, you bet you should believe that there is a purpose for it 
or there's, a, there's going to be a purpose for it. So Paul said, in order to keep me from being conceited, I, I got this thorn in my flesh. Now, many theologians talk about this thorn in the flesh. Um, when, you know, when I was growing up, because I've been, you know, in, in the way for a very long time. But when I was growing up as a kid, you know, and I heard preachers preaching about this, um, they, of course, they read some of the things that other theologians had said, other scholars. And it, it does, it's not like I've got some special revelation that I know something different than anybody else. But when you look at all of what all of the scholars say, basically there's, you know, three different areas that this could have been based on what was written. You know, he said, a thorn in my flesh. When it talks about flesh, sometimes that could be sinful nature, but sometimes that also could be you know, sickness or some kind of ailment. And so based on other scriptures in different places, some theologians believe that it was Paul's eyesight because he mentions that some, at some other point and some other when he was writing to someone else. Um, but it could be pain. It could be, uh, in one case, um, one theologian said it could be epilepsy or some kind of seizure of some kind that when Paul would, that he couldn't control. he get into these situations where he's talking about Jesus and you're getting all excited about it and he's starting having these fits or whatever. <laughs> and so uh, all of these things could be a recurrent fever, but he's saying, whatever this is, it's been bothering me. And, you know, he wanted, so after it was bothering him, he knew what the reason was. He said it was so that I wouldn't be conceited. But it, it could have been a sinful nature. It could have been something that he was just tempted to do, a temptation. Maybe he wanted to hit somebody, you know, that was, <laughs> that was bothering him. He said Satan was tormenting him. Maybe he wanted to just stop this torment right now. He knew how to stop people because he had thrown many Christians in prison before. And if it wasn't that, um, it could have been just figurative, where it was just the opposition of the enemy. And Paul had plenty, plenty of opposition persecution, one thing after another, shipwreck, he was beaten, left for dead, stoned, all of those things happened to him, and here he is still writing and loving God about, for who he is, and but he's saying, he gave me this thorn in my flesh. So, now with this thorn in the flesh, I've got a question for you, and that's this, and, and, and I'll, I'll get Thomasine in on this too. So now with this thorn in the flesh, he knows that it came from God or God allowed it to happen in whatever it was, whether it was sickness, whether it was just opposition from the enemy. He's saying, um, this thing is bothering me. And so now he has to make a decision. So what do you think Paul decided to do? You know, once he knows why it's there, what do you think he decided to do? And and if you're chatting back in, the, you know, in the chat window, you can share what you think Paul decided to do. What do you think Paul decided to do once he, you know, with this thing bothering him? And it wasn't just, um, you know, a nuisance kind of a thing. This was bothering him to the point where Paul is feeling like, I can't really do what God called me to do. This thing is bothering me. It's keeping me from, you know, being at my best at doing what God wants me to do. So what do you think Paul decided to do? What, 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 do you, what do you think he did? Well, I know you know what he did. <laughs> uh, you want me to go ahead and go with the scripture first? I'll go with the scripture first, and then you can talk. So what Paul did is the very next verse tells us what he did. If you're reading in your Bibles, um, the eighth verse said that he said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So Paul prayed. And this is not like, you know, he prayed three times. Um, the theologians talk about this and they say this means that Paul had some prayer time set aside for this particular thing, whether it was whenever it would happen, then he pray about it. But he's saying there were three times that I prayed earnestly and fervently about this. So Paul prayed about it. And that's what you should do also when you when something's going on, even if you think it's from the Lord. You can still pray. It's okay to ask God to take it away because that's what Paul said. He said three times I pleaded with the Lord to do what? Take it away, which is kind of what Thomasine was talking about with the cancer. Take it away. No, don't chemo it. 
take it away. I, you know, three times I pleaded with God to take this thing away. And whether that was sickness for Paul or just the opposition uh, of Satan, you know, bothering him to keep him from doing what he was doing for Jesus. He said, I pleaded with God three times to take this away from me. So it is okay, even if you know that God has a purpose for you going through this, it's okay to ask God to take this away. Right. Because even Jesus did that. Exactly. Yeah. When, even though Jesus knew why he came to earth, he knew what his purpose was. Mm-hmm. When Jesus was going through that agony in the garden, and he was trying to get folks to pray with him, and you know, they would fall asleep, and he was suffering, and he wanted somebody to pray, and they would fall asleep again. And Jesus was like, can't you just, can't just an hour, just give me an hour. Mm-hmm. Just pray for an hour. And so Jesus was agonizing. He knew what he came to earth to do. But yet, at some point when the suffering got to a certain, certain place, he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. It's like, Lord, if, can, can we do this another way? Can, can, can we do plan B, whatever? But can this cup just pass from me? Mm-hmm. And then, I hope I'm not jumping ahead. Go ahead. But then he did the same. He made a decision. Mm-hmm. He, he Just like, well, Jesus made a decision. And so actually Paul is kind of following that pattern because Jesus, after he said, can we do it another way, Lord? Can we do it another le- way? Then he says, after sweating great drops of blood, mm-hmm. nevertheless, your will be done. Your will be done. And it goes right back to what I was talking about with the soul. You know, our, our will is a part of the soul. It's what we make decisions and choices with. And so in all that agony, Jesus was able to stabilize his soul so he can say, okay, Lord, however you want to do it, nevertheless. Mm-hmm. You will be done. And I was thinking about, you know, Jesus didn't hear anything from God when he prayed that prayer. Hmm. He just said, he's like, I'm not hearing anything. So nevertheless, your will be done. Now, in Paul's case, if you look at the ninth verse, let's move down there. The ninth verse, he said, but that's the first thing he said. In other words, he said three times I pleaded that he'll take it away. But. He said to me, meaning that, you know, if you were a parent, you know, when you hear that, that means I'm not going to get what I want. Mm -hmm. He said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, what does that mean? (laughs) You know, that's that's loaded, but that's not what you want to hear when you want what you want. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. In a nutshell, what, what Jesus is saying, that's the other thing here. Paul is saying, I didn't, I'm not necessarily praying to God for this. I'm praying to the Lord, talking about Jesus, because that's who personally called him was mm-hmm. Jesus. And he feels like, you personally called me to this mission. I was out, you know, taking care of business, killing you guys. <laughs> and you called me, and now I'm a follower. Now I'm following you, and you are allowing this thing to bother me like this and I've pleaded with you three times to take it away and he said but he said to me my grace is sufficient so what Jesus is really saying to Paul is the grace you already have is enough now you don't need any more grace you don't need anything else from me the grace you already have is enough for you it's sufficient meaning it's enough for you It's sufficient. It's enough for you to um, move through this, whatever it is, this sickness to continue. In other words, you can still do what you were called to do. 
in the middle of all of this that's going on, you can still do it, and my grace is enough for you to do that. But it's the grace that you need to rely on. He said, because my grace is made perfect in weakness. My, gra- my grace being made perfect in weakness, meaning that it matures. That's, that word perfect just means mature. It comes to its completeness. In other words, there's something that grace wants to do that it cannot do unless you submit to the suffering and or adversity that God has for you to go through, whatever you want to call that. And until you do like Jesus did and do like Paul did. And and in other words, when Paul said, I pleaded three times, he's saying, once Jesus said, my grace is sufficient, I stopped pleading about that. He didn't, he didn't, I stopped praying about it. Still had the same issues. I stopped praying about it. But I realized, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough for you. See, grace is more than just an unmerited favor. Grace is more than just you getting something that you don't deserve, um, you know, or more than what you deserve. Grace is actually a power. It's actually a force. It's something, but it's only released when you um, humble yourself to receive it. And so instead of, um, you know, being humiliated in the situation, Paul is saying, I humble myself and said, okay, I submit to this, God. You, you're saying my grace is sufficient. Then I am going to submit myself to this and allow your power to have its way in my weakness. In other words, if I wasn't weak here, the power wouldn't have a way to be demonstrate it. Go ahead. It sounds like you want I'm to say something. I'm just getting excited because <laughs> can somebody somebody please put it in, in, in the chat box, grace is a force. Okay. And then put Pastor Woody's name in parentheses. Um, when you were talking about grace, um, God wanting to work something in us and, and something being worked in Paul, I was thinking about in these kind of situations, one of the things that God is trying to work in us, he wants the grace to work in us he wants to work and mature patience in us. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's consistency. God wants, wants us to be able to be consistent even in the midst of things that we don't understand. Because, I mean, I'm Paul's human-like as we are, he was. And I have to believe he had some conversations with God that dealt with, well, Lord, what's going on and, and, and why? And he, I'm sure he wanted to try to understand all this I'm doing for you, all of these missions, all of this persecution, all these yeah. things I'm going through, and I can't just get this one thorn right. out of my life. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. had to have some conversations with God. And, yeah. and, and um, in our minds at times like this, and this was true for me, I wanted understanding remember the first week we talked about understanding and so at some point though when that understanding doesn't come when those explanations don't come we have to decide to move from trying to explain God Mm -hmm. to making a decision to just trust God Mm -hmm. because I think about the first cancer journey with us Somebody had blessed me with a, a, a CD years ago, just all, well, at that time it was a cassette tape, and then we managed to get it on um, uh, CD when, when we went through the first cancer journey. And Pastor Woody and I would go, go to bed at night, and he would have one earbud in, in his ear, and I'd have the other one in my ear, and we listened to scripture all night long, healing scripture. For months and months and months and months and months and months, um, that's the process we went through. Mm-hmm. And I would wake up in the middle of the night in the CD, and I still use it from time to time now. Uh, but God did something. He, he worked a different way. Yes. You know, because journeys are, are unique. Yeah. And they're unique for each one of us. But just as Paul sought the Lord three times for that thorn to be taken away, I think about all the confessions, Mm -hmm. all the prayers, Mm -hmm. and all of that. I still had surgery the first time. Mm -hmm. I still went through radiation the first time. And so, again, I could 
I could have gotten into a circle, like an infinite loop of questions, but I had to decide, okay, I surrender those questions to the Lord and then just decide to trust him mm -hmm. and yield to him. Amen. And that is, we need to talk about that a little bit because when, um, when things don't turn out the way you believe they would or that you wanted them to turn out, you know, you've been waiting. You know, how do you make a decision as to what to do when it just doesn't turn out the way that you expected it to, that you believed it would? And, and, and I mean, so listen to me on this, because many of us, we, uh, you know, when I, when I say I grew up in church, a lot of what I'm talking about happened in the last 30 years of, of my church life, not the first 30 years of my first church life. In the first 30 years of my church life, it wasn't like this. But in the, the last 30 years of my church life, uh, you know, we've been led to believe that all you, if you can believe strong enough, if you have enough faith, and you say the right things. You gotta re you gotta say say it right. Now you find the scripture that God promised you. We say that you know you find your promise that God promised you, and you pray that prayer. You pray that scripture. You pray that promise, and then we feel like that's like a formula. I found the scripture. I believe it. God said He would do it, and so here. I believe he's going to do it. A plus B equals C. A plus B equals C. It's algebra, right? And so <laughs> we, and we reduce God to a formula. And he's not. You can't put God in a box and, and then because you prayed and because you believed and because you faithed it so strongly uh, that, it, you know, that this is the way it's going to be. You, the, the, the original purpose for faith was confidence in a person, which is God and the Holy Spirit, Jesus. That's relationship, not some formula to get something done for you or get it done the way you want it done. And so when Jesus, when Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient, he's saying that the, the I'm thinking of another process when I think about grace. You know, we talk about each of us have a motivational gift, which is a grace gift. Mm -hmm. Some of us are gifted in certain areas differently than others. There are things that Thomasine can do. Um, I may be able to do them, but Thomasine is able to do them a lot better than me or a lot, you know, with a lot less effort. Um, same, the same thing with you, and, you know. Um, there are things that you can do I might be able to do them, but you can do them with less effort. That means you have a grace to do that. You have a grace where it just seems simple to you, and you can, and the process, whatever's going on in your mind, in your hand coordination, whatever happens, you just have a grace to do that. Jesus is saying to Paul, my grace is sufficient for whatever you are going through. It's customized for your situation. But until you submit to me in the situation, you don't receive the customization. So you don't have, it's, you know, you don't allow grace to be customized to fit you in that situation because you've got this formula in your mind and the way that you want it to happen. When we need to relax and say, God, whatever you want to do, you are, I'm yours and so I submit to you so that you can do what you want to do in my life. I still believe that I am on mission and I'm on point for my mission for you and I'm going to do that. So what Jesus is saying to Paul, my grace is sufficient. It sustains you in life. It's, it, it releases the power. In other words, it, this, this kind of grace is the, is the kind of grace that's available after crucifixion. So it's the power is resurrection power. I used to hear my mom say that all the time, resurrection power. It's a power that's released after Jesus has been raised from the dead. So when he said, um, my grace is sufficient for you, but my power is made perfect in your weakness, then that's the release of that power when you submit yourself to him. Because in other words, um, the request was denied. Go ahead. I just wanted to jump in and, and just mention the whole thing of promise again, just so we're not conf confused. Because um, Pastor Woody's not saying don't believe the promises of God. 
-hmm. And I'm not saying make the promise of God a, a formula. Mm -hmm. And so we are definitely in agreement with that. What, what, when I say get a promise, I mean get God's heart mm -hmm. for, for concerning that situation. But what the promise does for me and what the promise does for us, it should point us to the promise keeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where the relationship comes in. Yes. Because, because what I do, when I think about the promises of God, when I think about what he says, then I think about who he is. Mm -hmm. And if I can remember, that's who made the promise. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. Then that's what gives me hope. Mm -hmm. And I know that no matter how he works the promise in my life, mm -hmm. that I will still come out in victory. Yes. And that's the difference. You know, when you lock in to the promise keeper, then you don't have to, you know, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm looking at the formula. I'm looking at all the things that I did, I didn't do, and wonder what I didn't do right. Did I get this out of the right places? Does, does B go before C? Is C always equal to A plus B? You know, all of the, we go through all of those different things in our mind when we should just relax and say, okay, God's got this. And, you know, I'm trying to do what he called me to do. And so as Paul said, he said, Paul had to make another decision. Now that he was, his request was denied, what did he do? You know, he had, what do you do when God says no? What do you do when God says no to the way you want it to happen? What do you, wait, what do, you do when it seems like it's just no period? You know, you, um, you, you're, there's no special, you know, because sometimes we say, well, God just likes me, you know. <laughs> I'm, God, I'm God's favorite person, um, and maybe you are, but we need to realize that, um, you know, when we submit to God's will, God has more in store for us than what we can see, and sometimes, as Paul, he had received, remember, this whole thing was allowed to come on him because he had received this great revelation from God, this vision that nobody else had seen that he couldn't even talk about. I mean, he couldn't talk about it anyway. It's <laughs> that he couldn't talk about. And, and so, go ahead. Yeah, I just thought about, as you were talking, it just I got a picture of myself concerning this thing when, when Paul said, so that I would not be exalted above measure. And um, I was thinking about how, again, Paul must have had, have been thinking too about I'm doing all this for you Lord and I've done this and I've done this and done that we can begin to think that we're qualified for healing okay yeah that mm -hmm. because and I so, got a right to it that's right because yeah. and and in my case I was thinking Lord I drink water and we do yeah right we do because of yes yeah. The, the promise, but go ahead. Right. I'm sorry. But see, you could think, okay, I'm earning it because I got these check marks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in my case, Lord, I haven't eaten beef. I haven't eaten pork in decades. I, I work out. I drink water. I <laughs> um, do all these, these check, things. Check, yeah. Check. And so it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can get kind of puffed up and think, Okay, I'm entitled to this healing because, after all, I have done this, this, and this, and this. And then we can look at other people who haven't done this, 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 and this, and this. Mm -hmm. Lord, I t take the medicine every day. I mm -hmm. do this. And it's so easy to compare ourselves when, right, right. when you see somebody else. Wow. Mm -hmm. When you see somebody else getting the blessing that you want. Uh-huh. And you believe that you're doing all the things that you ought to do mm -hmm. to get that blessing. And they did nothing. That's right. That's what it, that's what it feels like. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, people stand outside of cancer centers and smoke <laughs> and, and don't have a relapse. Yeah. People okay. don't take their medication or, or whatever all these things are that we can name that we feel that we do. And so we believe, Lord, then if I did all that, why didn't I get my healing? 
and why didn't I get it the way I wanted to? Right, right. So that's that's really what um, that's part of what I had to get past. Not so much compare myself to other people, but just like Lord, how did this happen? When I'm doing this, this, and this, when it it wasn't about the bottom line, isn't about what I do. Yeah. And that brings us to, you know, we need to wrap this up. Um, As Paul was talking, he said, um, okay, my request was denied. Mm -hmm. Now what am I going to do? Paul had to make a decision, and you do too. And that's whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Jesus follower, you know, you need to make a decision when things don't work out the way that you expected them to. And you can make the kind of decision that Paul made that will make a difference for the rest of your life. And that's what Paul decided to do. If you go to the ninth verse here, Paul says, therefore, in other words, he said, my grace is sufficient and it made perfect in my power is made perfect in your weakness. He said, therefore, in other words, because of this, here's what I'm going to do. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Not boast about the healing, not boast about that God can do it, but I will boast more gladly about my weakness. I will boast more gladly about what I'm not proficient at, what I'm, what I'm not perfect at at whatever my weakness is, whether it's a sickness or whatever it is, whatever this thing that I can't control, be, I will boast more gladly about that so that Christ's power may rest on me. So Paul is saying that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, you know, relax in God yes. and not look so hard on getting this thing fixed that I'm not doing what he asked me to do. And I'm more focused on my problem than I am on what I'm putting in the earth to do, what I'm being called to do. He said, therefore, I'll boast more gladly about my, uh, uh, you know, weakness so that the power of God can rest on me. See, sometimes the very thing that you're trying to get rid of is the irritant that opens the door to humility and humility opens the door to that abundant grace. And sometimes we are, we are so prideful because of who we are, what we've gotten from God. We feel like, I mean, think about it. We, we, to some degree, we would do this every single day. We feel like, um, um, you know, I'm as wealthy as I am because I obey God, you know, um, I am I'm healthy because I obey God. Uh, I have good relationships because I obey God. Well, sometimes the very thing that you're trying to get rid of is just enough irritant that it opens the door to humility, where that humility now opens the door to that customized grace. It's customized for the situation so that it releases resurrection power. Otherwise, resurrection power would never be released if you were not humble enough to submit to the situation and allow God to work through the situation in that situation for you. And so um, this, Paul says in the next verse, the very last verse we'll look at in the 10th verse, he said, that is why for Christ's sake, now this is the decision he made, that is why (laughs) <laughs> Excuse me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. For the purpose of Christ. To, uh, to, to get Christ's ultimate agenda out. For Christ's sake. Since I know what he really is about, to be about what he is about, I will delight in my weaknesses. And he goes on. He didn't just stop there. He kind of explained what he meant by weaknesses. He said, I'll delight in weaknesses. I'll delight in insults. In other words, so some of this was just, the, you know, just the retaliation he was getting from some of the other Jewish leaders and who saw themselves as apostles. He said, I will delight in hardship. You know, delight means that I will take pleasure in. I'll take extra pleasure in. It's like, 
You know, when, when, I, when I was growing up, I thought about this. When I was growing up, we grew up on the farm. We had hogs, cows, you know, uh, dogs, chickens, everything. But, <laughs> but when, when it was a hot day, really hot day, and it was hot in Mississippi a lot, you know, um, hogs used to love to get in the slop, just get in the mud and wallow in it. And they, that was like delightful. And, one, and I, didn't, I didn't understand this then, but I understand now is because that was a way to kind of get to cool off and get that mud on you and also to keep the sun from baking your skin. <laughs> and so you just wallow in it, just delight in it. He's saying, I'm going to just wallow in these hardships because I know Jesus is with me. I'm going to wallow in these persecutions because I know Jesus is with me. I'm not in this alone. I'm going to wallow in these difficulties as they come because I am not alone and I am submitting to the ultimate who is in this with me. For he said, for when I am weak, when I acknowledge that I can't do this by myself, when I acknowledge that I'm gone, I've gone to my limits, I can't heal myself in this, I can't do whatever my body normally does and renew itself every, you know, whether 21 days or three months or a year or seven years, whatever's going on, whatever's happening, it's not happening uh, in the way I want it to happen. He's saying, I'm going to delight in this because when I am weak, yes. he makes me strong. Goodness. For he, his actual word says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So the strength that I'm looking for is only after I acknowledge my weakness and allow the grace to work through that weakness. So it's almost like Paul got, no, we got, no, we're wrapping up. Almost like Paul First, we started off, he had this great revelation where he was caught up. He didn't know if he was in his body or out of, out of his body. And so God didn't want him to glory in that. Mm -hmm. So then God gives him this whole other revelation that right. he did want him to glory in, and that's mm -hmm. in his infirmities because mm -hmm. that's the way to humility. Right. And that's the way to grace. Grace. Wow. God wants his grace to work. So... Mm. Really, we need to change our focus. We need to change our focus from prayer to remove mm. to joy to go through. Ooh. Somebody write that, please. <laughs> we, it's just a change of focus because God is going to be with you either way. Change our focus from a prayer to remove this from me to a pr from a prayer to remove to the joy to go through. And there's something that happens when you go through. Mm -hmm. So I've, I, I, I coined this phrase this morning. My favorite thing to do is to move from a prayer to remove to a joy to go through. Because oh, Paul is saying mm -hmm. this, when he says, I delight in this now, in other words, he's saying, that's my favorite thing to do. That's my favorite thing to do is to move from prayer to remove to joy to go through. And that's when the release of power happens. So here's our challenge for you today. Our challenge is this. It is to decide. It's a decision that we have to make first. So your challenge, our challenge is to decide during this time when you, during this meantime, in the meantime, when nothing's happening you know, the way you wanted to. In the meantime, to decide during this meantime that you will not be deterred or hampered by your limiting circumstances. That's the first decision. I will not be hampered, and therefore you could pray about it, but don't just give up on it. So it's not like I'm just giving in to it. Mm -hmm. He's saying, so don't, you know, decide that while I'm going through this, I will not be deterred or stopped by these limiting circumstances. But instead of just waiting, your challenge is to take excessive pride. <laughs> Here we go with pride again. And that's what Paul is saying I did. He said, take excessive pride 
in exposing your adversity. Take excessive pride in exposing your weakness. Take excessive pride in uh, exposing whatever your limiting circumstances and abilities are. Exposing it to what? You're exposing that to God's grace. Because that grace is what gives you that power. You expose that to God's grace and allow him to release his power through the adversity. So you expose the adversity to grace and then God allows his power to work through grace through your adversity where now you are empowered. You end up being stronger than you were before. Hallelujah. And so here is um, some action steps, a couple of action steps for you this week. Identify and implement. So don't just identify it, but implement this too. Uh, and by the way, um, the... The, the challenge is already uploaded for you. So even though I can't show it to you on the screen, you can download this if you go to our website, if you're not already there. If you're watching from the website, you can just click on weekly challenge and you can download it or just read it and, or print it, whatever you'd like to do. But it's available to you. If you are not on our website, you can also go to our Facebook groups page and go to files and today's challenge will be the newest challenge that's under files. So um, then when you, when, you, when you see that, you'll see here that the first step that you, we want you to do and think about this week is identify and implement several ways that you can show off God's supernatural ability. And that's what Paul did. I mean, we don't know to what extent Paul would have done what he's done if he hadn't allowed this to happen to him and through him and allow God to work through him. Mm -hmm. And so show off God's supernatural abilities through your limiting abilities. We have limiting, limited abilities, but God has supernatural abilities and he wants to show off his supernatural abilities through our limiting abilities through grace. And we receive that grace when we humble ourselves uh, in any situation to allow him to be able to show up. And then the last step here is to identify at least one other person who may be experiencing similar adversity that you are or have and help them to find at least one thing that they can do. You know, we, we look at what we start focusing on what we can't do and then we start praying that God remove it because of what I can't do. Focus on what you can do against the odds of the circumstances. Identify with that person and then find at least one way that you can use your adversity to augment your purpose. You know, Paul said, I'm going to renew my purpose now. And in, in my weakness, I'm going to allow God to do every single thing. I'm just, in other words, I'm going hog wild. I'm going, I'm going to do everything I can do. I'm just going to allow the spirit of God to move through me, the grace of God to move through me to do everything that he called me to do. So um, I want to pray for you now and, and give you the opportunity to just in prayer receive what God is, is saying to you concerning what you're going through in your meantime. You know, we all go through different things and, uh, you know, we're we're all at a different place, you know, in in our lives. And God wants to he wants to move and do some things, even though you may be experiencing limitations. And so in, in the middle of that, let me just pray for you right now. Thank Father, Jesus. we thank you in Jesus name for the grace that you've made available to us. For whatever circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in, knowing that, first of all, you are in it with us and we're not in it alone. But as we f change our focus from what we are going through and what we want to get removed to changing our focus to allowing you to work through us, knowing that you're with us and you're working through us. I pray that you will work through these people today that are here in this prayer, watching this um, message and experiencing this, that you will move in their lives, make a difference in, in them through whatever they're going through and make your power known in Jesus' name. Amen.
I hope you enjoyed that. And not just enjoyed it, but I hope that it was meaningful to you. I hope that you found something in there that will make a difference in your life, especially this week. Decisions that you have to make concerning so many different things. Like what do you do while you wait? What do you do um, while you are waiting on God, while you're waiting on something else? Things that you can't control. So I trust that this message was a blessing to you. And I just want to pray with you right now and thank God for you joining us this weekend. So bow your heads, please. Father, we thank you today for this message. And we trust that this word will make a difference in somebody's life this week, that you will touch hearts, that you will touch souls, minds, and even those who've been waiting for so long, God. And, and we understand that it's based on your timing but we surrender ourselves to your timing and thank you for, feel, for fulfilling your word in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you. Have a good weekend. Have a good 4th of July.